Okay, here we go. We're live. Today's another day. All you kids out there that are doing uh, learning away from school and all you teachers out there that are trying to teach school without being in school, we feel for you. We decided to have a show and I'm a lucky guy. I called up some of my author buddies and I asked them if they wanted to come on. So today we have Floyd Cooper, a fabulous illustrator, a wonderful speaker who's been to thousands of schools. I think one of the great things today is that everyone you see on this show today has been to thousands of schools, not hundreds, thousands. So we got Floyd Cooper, there's Floyd right there. Then we have Broad Baggart, a poet from New Orleans, a performance poet from New Orleans. Is Broadie gonna be there on the screen? And then we have Carmen Didi, a wonderful author who I saw speak maybe 20 years ago. And she was such a fabulous speaker. I, I left the auditorium saying, wow, I'm a terrible speaker. I gotta, I gotta learn my craft. So I can honestly say after I saw Carmen Didi speak one day, I said to myself, I gotta learn my craft. I gotta learn how to speak to an audience. Um, so there's three wonderful, three, uh, well, a poet, a wonderful illustrator, and another author in me. My name is Jerry Pilata. You might know me from the Who Would Win series. But today we're gonna kick off the show with uh, Floyd Cooper. So I'll ask you a couple questions, Floyd. Where are you from? Where are you uh, from right now? Where are you sitting? Uh, we're, we are in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, Forks Township, just north of I'm Eastern. up in Boston, Massachusetts. Wow, how far am I from Boston? What's that? You said, how far am I from Boston? No, no, hear. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I just wanna say, what wonderful technology. You're in Philly, I'm in Boston. Absolutely. Hey, Brody, where are you? Uh, I'm at the, a country place in Mississippi up in the hills, but I live in New Orleans. But right now I'm in the hills of Mississippi. And Carmen, where are you today sitting? Where are you sitting? I am in my home in Stone Mountain, Georgia, just outside Atlanta. Very good. Okay, so today Floyd's gonna go first. Floyd, tell us about yourself. Well, I'll tell you about myself by sharing an embarrassing secret. I have an embarrassing secret, but I feel I'm amongst my friends, so I can share this with you. You may not know this. Um, well, I, well, I collect erasers. <laughs> I collect erasers. Um, now, everyone knew that I used erasers to work with, but you didn't know I'd started an extensive eraser collection and they're taking over the house. They're everywhere. They're all over the place. I don't know if you can see them behind me, I have all kinds of ink erasers. I have uh, pink erasers. I have erasers with little brooms on them so you can sweep, uh, sweep the kitchen. I have, uh, I have the uh, ear eraser that I found in the airport. They found Van Gogh's ear in the airport. Who would have thought it? I also have erasers that are electric. Electric, Ooh. that's right. An electric eraser, boys and girls. And it is uh, pretty cool. It runs on two AAA batteries, has a switch, and an eraser. Is that cool or is that lazy? I think we're getting lazy, I don't know. My wife Velma has a teacup with a switch on it. You uh, click the switch and it stirs your tea. I didn't know, I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I guess stirring your tea can worry out before lunch, who knew? Well, nonetheless, none of those erasers are my favorite. I have a favorite eraser. Of all the erasers that I have, I have a favorite eraser. My friends, my favorite eraser are the stretchy erasers. Whoa, you have to be careful. These erasers are very stretchy, but you can get yourself one. They come um, in most art supply stores for about a buck or two bucks. You can get a, a piece like this. Uh, that piece is about a quarter. That piece is about a nickel. So it's like sausage, uh, you know, bring your piggy bank. Now, what I'm going to do is share with you uh, some pictures that will kind of show you my life. It's not a lot. Um, it started in a little town in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I like to draw, and I drew all over my, my folks' house when I was three, and uh, it's not a pleasant experience, not a pleasant memory. I don't remember much about that day, but it could be why I like erasers, because I was very busy rubbing that stuff off, you know, and it's sort of ingrained in me, and I can't get it out of me, so I am who I am, right? 
Now, I was the oldest of four kids. Uh, we were pretty poor. Um, and I was the oldest, so that means that when my folks went around, I was the boss. I was the chief. I was the sheriff in town. If you look at this picture, you can tell which one is me. Yes, you're right, the kid with the star. And I walked around with my jacket pulled back all day just to let everybody know, hey, the sheriff is here. You better straighten up. I was also in charge of a family pet. Now, we had this little dog named Billy. I miss Billy. Billy was special. Billy was like no other dog. Um, I don't know why my folks named him Billy, but man, that was a cool dog. It was a cool dog, little puppy Billy. He would fetch. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Please don't tell Billy he's a goat. He doesn't <laughs> want to hear that. He will fetch. He will roll over. He, uh, he even tried to bark once. But nonetheless, Billy's not with us anymore. I'll try to replace Billy at some point. My uh, first book was a little golden book, and uh, I'll show that in just a minute here. But when I was seven years old, for my birthday, someone gives me the coolest, most awesomest gift in the world. It was a little tray of watercolors with a scraggly brush. And I went out and started painting stuff. I painted this, I painted that. And I, uh, when I was nine years old, I painted a picture of my great grandparents' house and my teachers noticed my work. And they began to say good things in my ear. What happens? when your teacher says good things in your ear. It makes you feel good, right? Well, the more they said, the more I drew. And I drew and drew and drew myself right out of the ghetto into college. That's how I got out of the projects and into college. My son here didn't know that. He's his first time hearing this story. He's looking at me differently now. <laughs> yes, yes, I lived in the projects, Kai. Okay, now, <clears throat> I, uh, I went on to college and graduated and went to work for a big, a little mom and pop uh, greeting card company. I don't know if you've ever heard of Hallmark, Hallmark. What about Walmart? Walmart? Okay, Walmart, close enough. Um, and this is what my work looks like now. Um, this is the way I put it up on the walls after I've erased everything. These pictures were all erased with the stretchy eraser. And I put it all up on the wall so that I can see everything that I'm erasing and working on as I go so they don't get too confused because you don't want page 14 on page three and you definitely don't want page 32 on page one. So it's good to keep it all straightened out. Although it looks like quite a mess there, but believe me, everything is in order. And uh, these are some of my books, um, probably too much. Hey, yeah. Should wow. I stop now? Should I stop? Is that enough? <laughs> please, maybe one no. more. Can I do one more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more turkey get dinner, more, please. More. Oh. All right. Well, my, uh, my latest book that no one's seen yet, I will unveil today. This is the uncovering or the unveiling or whatever they call it when they unveil the cover. I never understood that little exercise, but I'm going to do it here for you now. This is a book that I just finished hot off the presses about a young man who flew across the country, the first man to fly across the United States whose skin was brown. And uh, he did it in a little raggedy makeshift plane and uh, got across, and it's a true story, uh, called James... Uh, James Herman Banning, and it's called Sprouting Wings, and you'll love this story if you like flying and planes and all sorts of cool things like that. Um, you can see me on uh, Daniel Tiger, on the episode of Daniel Tiger, the one where Daniel doesn't want to be alone, and tonight, uh, Dolly Parton, sorry, Jerry, Dolly Parton's kicking off her uh, uh, Dolly's Bedtime Story Time, and you can catch me uh, on April 23rd. She'll be reading Max and the Tagalong Moon, but please uh, check Wait. in with Dolly. She's, uh, she's doing some great, wonderful things for kids. Every Thursday night on her channel, you can Google, Google Goodnight Dolly, Goodnight with Dolly, and find out where that, what that is. And you can get down to the post office and get yourself one of my fancy Kwanzaa stamps to slap on your electric bill. Uh, tell your mom and dad that, you know, to put down those Christmas tree stamps and pick up that Kwanzaa stamp and put that on the envelope. Who knows, it may lower your electric rates. Now, um, that's my uh, life that's flashed before your eyes. I hope I didn't talk too fast. You can see some of my other books here. This is, um, oh, no, you can't. One second here, my technician is working feverishly. Did you hear me? Feverishly. Do you need a napkin? Yes. <laughs> uh, here's the, <laughs> here's, <laughs> he does. This is the little golden book that I told you about. And uh, here's a really big book. I don't know why they made this book so big. I think they're sending me a message. They're trying to, send me a subliminal clue here with this big giant book called The Big Day. So go get yourself one of these. 
and get yourself a new table to put it on. Thank you, guys. Hey. Thank you that was great. Promise me, promise me uh, Floyd, at the end of the show, you'll do a little drawing with the eraser. Oh, yes. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that with a marker. All right. Very good. Okay, you want me to do that, that was now? fantastic. You want me to do that now? Or? Yeah, you can do it now. All right, let's do a little drawing. What I'm going to do the lighting is start weird. with a, a narrative here. Um, there's going to be this kid, right? Now you can zoom in, buddy. There you go. Feel free the to lighting's zoom in. weird, yeah. Yeah, he's here and he is looking kind of what? What does he look like? He's looking kind of uh, he's looking kind of down, don't you think? Is he looking kind of sad? Let's all go. Oh, oh, he's kind of sad. What can we do to cheer? The, you can't. We can't, can't see, see the image. Oh, oh okay. Let's 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 Yeah. How about now? When you lean over, make a shot. Have your son come closer. Have your son come closer. How's that? That's, yeah, that's closer. Better. That's better. Closer. Yeah, you can see it. Closer. There we go. That's better. There we go. That's good. Can you see him now? He's even sadder now. Yes, perfect. He had to do all that moving. So yep, yeah, you guys really made him even sadder. Okay. So what can we do to make this kid happy? What can we do to make this kid happy? What can we give him? How about some toys? Would that work? No. He's still sad. He has toys with little bows on it and gifts that he hasn't even opened. And there's a little truck there and he doesn't. It's just, it's not working. What else can we give him? A pet? How about a pet? Yes, we'll give him a goldfish. Will that work? He's holding a little goldfish. Oh, will that work? No, he's still sad. What is the thing that could make everybody so happy that we haven't drawn donut. a donut? Who said donut? Did you say donut? A donut? Donuts. Donuts. <laughs> donuts. <laughs> donuts. They're, they fell out and they're all rolling away, bro. They're rolling away. The donuts are round and they rolled away. So he's still sad. I, do, I what? know. What? You give... You, you take him to places. Take him places. All right. Let's give him some uh, rollerblades or some skateboards. Or What's he on? Some, is he on a skateboard? He's wearing skates on a skateboard. Wow. That's a feat. Will that work? He's going fast. Is it working? Yeah. He's still sad. You know what, what we can do? Let's do give this. Him a smile. Do this. And we'll do this. And he has, what is this? He has a happy friend. I think that may do it because guess what? He's starting to smile. <gasps> is it working? It is works. a happy friend what it is? It is works. that what makes us happy? Whenever you're feeling sad, go find yourself a happy friend. It'll rub off and you'll be happy too. Thank you, guys. I'm going to write. Oh, Nico wants to write a little drawing for you real quick. He came all this way for nothing. Go right ahead, Nico. Make a, okay, what is that, Nico? All right. Very good. Nico has made a potato on a stick. All right, let's hear it from Nico, everybody. Thank you. Nico. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> Take care. Woo. Oh, he's still going. You guys can cut whenever you. Whenever you feel like. <laughs> All right, Brody, oh. you're up. Wait a minute. Look at that. That is good. I didn't know Nico could draw that. Oh, <laughs> you've been holding it back, buddy. I got a place. I'm putting this kid to work. We're going to the Looks studio. Like <laughs> Look at that. That is. Look at that. <laughs> this kid has highlights in the eye. Whoa. Is that a flapjack? What is that? No. Okay. All right, let's stand aside and let everybody see it. Stand to the side just a little bit. See, look at that. Wow. wow. How old are you, Nico? How old four. are you? He's four. Four years old. All right, guys, thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Nico. Um, Yes. You're ready, buddy. Uh -huh. That, yes, I like that. He's looking at that. Yes, yeah, you made him look at right at the potato in his hair. How did you do that? I That's know. Just amazing. Okay, Brad, off you go. <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh, yeah, that <laughs> was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, good job, buddy. Good to see you, Floyd. So, yes, so, man. so Floyd is clearly a visual person. He, visual. He, right. he, I'm, I'm always amazed to watch him take a, 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 a piece of chalk or a piece of charcoal and make things happen. You know, I'm quintessentially the opposite of that. I, if I close my eyes, I see black. There's nothing there. <laughs> my whole world is smell and, <laughs> and it's the sound, the sound of language. So, um, so it, when I write, when I write, I'm writing a song. I don't think about <laughs> writing. Daddy's name. Now, because I write the, the um, uh, uh, other people see things, but I don't. In any event, I thought I'd start with an eraser because uh, Floyd mentioned erasers. <laughs> so this is a poem. I, I took uh, my first four books uh, from Boyd's Mills Press and rolled them all, actually my first five books, and rolled them all into one book. And this is the eraser. So there's a central metaphor in this poem. It's the eraser. It's a concrete object, but it's a child speaking uh, and, it's, and it's not a happy poem, but it's, a, it's, it's thoughtful, the eraser. I made a lot of mistakes today. 12 minus five does not equal eight. Carrot does not start with a K. And I hate you. Get away from me. <laughs> Was not a nice thing to say. I erased the eight and wrote seven. I erased the K and wrote C. The method can erase the T as you cried because of me. So I wrote this little poem to find a way to say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for hurting you today. I got to take a bow, you clock from it. Uh, so, I write, so I write, I'm a poet. I write poems. Yes. And I write poems in voice for people to perform. Um, lots of poets write almost exclusively in their own voice, which is a perfectly appropriate thing to do. Uh, I've written maybe a thousand poems in my own voice, and I frankly got tired of hearing myself. Uh, so I, I write poems in other people's voices. When I write for children, I write poems in the voice of children. Um, so let's see, with, uh, the Booger Love is a favorite, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, let's see, I'll do uh, uh, Giant Children. Psst. Listen very closely, there's something you should know. It's all about a giant school where giant children go. Pages turn at giant speed as giant children learn to read. And, uh, and giant brains are really quick at working on arithmetic. They pound the beat with giant drums and finger paint with giant thumbs. Gi sing giant songs with giant lips and boogie dance with giant hips. Giant shoes on giant feet and giant giggles when they meet. I watch them hour after hour. Giant kids with giant power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just the classroom handful. I promise you it's true. This is the school where giants go, and the giant kids are you. So um, <laughs> I write poems in the voice of children for them to perform. Then one thing I started doing uh, is I started writing content poems. That is poems that have rich content, either in social studies or in language arts, but particularly in science. And as it turns out, the stuff of science makes great metaphors for poems. So I've started a series uh, of books called the uh, Heart of Science series. The first one is Maybe You, which is about science's inquiry. The next is Systematic Me, which is body parts and systems. The next was My Home in the Universe, which is about space. Weather and Climate, which is about weather and climate. And I just finished uh, Earth Science. I called it Big Mama for Big Mama Earth. Uh, and these poems, again, are performable poems, um, um, but they actually teach the content. So for example, this is a poem called the Excretory Chair. Now, um, excretory is the word that 
it refers to the bodily systems that get rid of bodily waste. And the principal bodily waste are carbon dioxide in your breath from your breathing, sweat and salt and a little lactic acid in your sweat, uh, uric acid in urine, uh, and feces, which is actually part of a digestive system. So um, I wrote a poem called The Excretory Chia. The Excretory Chia. Stinky breath, stinky sweat, stinky yellow pee, stinky stuff inside of you, stinky stuff in me. Everybody <laughs> ready? Everybody, <laughs> the excretory system, that's how we get it out. Stinky breath, stinky sweat, stinky yellow pee, stinky <laughs> stuff inside of you. <laughs> so, so the idea is to entertain children, but this really teaches the excretory system. I mean, you can learn the extra, the, I have a, my youngest grandson is now five. When he was three, uh, in this Facebook, I did some stuff with black holes. And, he, and, and by the time he was four, he knew all the vocabulary of black holes oh, really? and used it as simply and as with confidence uh, in the same way he might say bicycle or automobile or PlayStation or whatever. You know, just, it was uh, it, not complex, not advanced, not defeat knowledge, it was just fun for him. Uh, some of the poems are a lot more serious. So in Maybe You, the idea is to encourage you young scientists to believe in yourselves and to think in terms of making a contribution to your generation. So this is a poem called Knowledge in Motion. Uh, to, to get this poem, you have to understand, probably the two greatest scientists and mathematicians of all time were Sir Isaac Newton, who was in the 1600s, uh, and basically the theory of gravity and uh, 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 and, and, and how it works by, well, by the inverse square relationship uh, was, um, uh, was his work. Um, and then Einstein, Einstein, 300 years later. Uh, so knowledge in motion. Isaac Newton declared the magnificent motion that three basic laws govern objects in motion. This giant idea was the ultimate thing. And for almost three centuries, Newton was king. Then Einstein declared it's important to know that these laws only work when the motion is slow. But as speeds start approaching the swiftness of light, the laws of Sir Isaac are no longer right. So you see how our knowledge keeps inching along. It seems perfect today, but tomorrow it's wrong. And who will be next to propose something new? First Newton, then Einstein, and next, maybe you. All right. So. And, well, you. And, and as a performer, uh, Carmen will, will understand this. As a perform Carmen is one of the great performers of our generation. And oh. as a performer, you really need audience feedback, you know, without it. So in, in any event, um, yeah, so, so 18 days ago, my wife and I went to our place out in the country and locked the gate behind us, and, and we've been in quarantine since then. And I feel really detached. And the way, the way that I make myself not lonely is by writing poems. It's the reason I write poems, because uh, it's really hard for me to communicate with people in a way where I, where I can really just be me. But I can do it in a poem. Um, and so I started writing coronavirus poems. And I've been doing one a day and putting them up on my Facebook for free. Uh, if you go to my website, broadbagot.com, there's a thing uh, on the menu, there's a Corona poems, and it'll bring you to a page where you can see all of them. There's six posted right now. The seventh one will be posted tomorrow, and there'll be one a day every weekday uh, until there are 30 of them. And I, I've, I've only written seven, but I'm, I'm, I'm right now writing seven and eight. So uh, here, here's the first one. Um, actually, no, this one. Yeah, actually, okay, we'll, we'll do this one. This was, I think, the one that either went up today or it's going up tomorrow. Is this the one about? No, no this is already up. Dear Corona. The human race? Is this the one about the human the race? Do you mention the human no, race, that yet. one? No. I, right. I'm not sure. I, 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 dear Coronavirus, do you sometimes miss your mother when you're out there in the room? Do you ever get so lonely that you won't go back home? Do you really have to work so hard at making people sad? Do you think it's good to make the sick or do you think it's bad? Please, coronavirus, please, for goodness sake, don't you think it's time for you to take a little break? Do you have to mess up everything? Do you have to be so naughty? Tomorrow is my birthday. I was going to have a party. Now, the funny thing about that is party 
and naughty in my vernacular and my New Orleans quasi Brooklyn accent is a perfect rhyme. But I got a, a text from a friend of mine, uh, from uh, Dr. Julie from uh, uh, Missouri, and she said, "Party and naughty don't and naughty don't rhyme." You know, but for me, there's no R in party. You know, uh, but that's one of the one of the challenges of writing oral language. Uh, Let's see, one, one of my other favorites in this, let's do the first one, Dear Coronavirus. Writing month. Yes. My Corona Diploma. The world could be a germy place. We wash our hands, we wash our face. Soapy water feels so nice. Nice, we're singing happy birthday twice. And yes, we know just what to do, because you love me and I love you. So when we talk and when we play, we stand at least six feet away. The world could be a germy place. We wash our hands, we wash our face. Soapy water feels so nice. We're singing happy birthday twice. We're very smart. We're very tough. So hear a shout. Enough's enough. Corona, you are such a pain. We're going to wash you down the drain. The world can be a germy place. We wash our hands. We wash our face. Soapy water feels so nice. We're singing happy birthday twice. So again, it's instructional. The idea is for it to be empowering, a little bit fun. Um, uh, and it's in language that rhymes and sings and has rhythm and it's uh, and it's my favorite thing in the world to do. So, um, it, he, so here's, here's about the ultimate statement that I can make about what it feels like for me to do my work. I can't tell you how happy I am to have these new poems that I'm making and to know that people out there are getting them. By the way, you can get these for free. You go to broadbagger.com, select Corona Poems, download them, put them on your website, give them away, use them with your children. Do whatever you want. If you want to publish them commercially, I'll give you a free license. The idea is to get the poems out there. Um, but this is the most, the, the, the most deeply satisfying, meaningful thing that I can do. And it makes me really happy, even though there's a lot of sad stuff going on. But that's what it is to be. All right, Brody. Brody, thank you very much. That was wonderful. All right. All right, Carmen. Bravo. All right, Carmen, you're well, up. Well, you know, I just love that. Floyd is drawing and Brad is writing poetry and I am neither a visual artist nor a poet, but I have such respect for both as you do when you don't do something. But maybe children, you're noticing that what we're doing as artists during this time when we're stuck home, just like you are, is we're doing what we do, even though we don't have you to share it with the normal way, like in a school visit, even if the computer is off or the phone or there's no Zoom, you know what we're doing? We're writing, we're drawing, we're talking stories out loud to ourselves. That's right. what artists do. And there are a lot of you out there who are artists. So I'm gonna tell you just a couple quick things about me um, and I'll be quick about it because blessed are the brief. So this is my new book <laughs> called Rita and Ralph's Rotten Day. I love the back cover. It says, have you ever been really mad at your best friend? <laughs> Most of us have been. Well, I'm not going to tell you much about the story other than it's about falling out with your best friend and figuring out how to get back to them again by going up the hill and down the hill and up the hill and down the hill. So how does a book become a book? Well, before it was this, I want to show you something. It was this. See those loose leaves? doesn't even have a spine. Give. These are called F and G's, folded and gathered sheets. And that's when you first see your book kind of looking like a book, but not quite, because you know now how it looks at the end. So let's go back one more step. This is the F and G with the pictures and the, and the, and the text dropped into place. Before that, as the author, before the illustrator can draw anything, I have to write it down. You see this thing? This is this story. This little tiny book. It's a picture book. Wow. There may be 30 drafts, maybe even as many as 40 drafts of this picture book. A picture book, children. This is not J.K. Rowling's, you know, one of her beautiful <laughs> tomes. This is a picture book. And teachers, I hope that the children are paying attention to this. And, you know, and when you get to class, remind them. Because I bet that Broad writes and rewrites his poetry. And Floyd, I will bet dollars to donuts 
that you draw things and then you draw them again and change them and you like them better another way? Absolutely. Pipe in, boys. <laughs> Wee! Yeah. Wee! Yeah. Wee, buddy! <laughs> I, I, I guess what we're telling I you with like that is, yes, writers and artists and poets and musicians and baseball players and physicians, nurses, we, everyone that works starts at the very beginning knowing nothing. And because we love it, we do it again and again and again until it becomes second nature, until it becomes what we would do if we couldn't do anything else, we would do that. What we would do even in a quarantine. Go figure. Yeah. So I have another book I just turned in a couple of years ago. See all that? Lots of drafts. It's called The Children's Moon. I'm not going to tell you too much about that either, but it's how the moon ends up in the sky on a clear blue day. The illustrator is Jim LaMarche, and I, can, I cannot show you these. I want to. This is called The Dummy Book. I think I can sort of just show you because it only has the cover. This is a different incarnation. This is even further back. This is when your story is done and the illustrator starts to put the illustrations down and they send it in so that it can be approved by an art director. Don't get bored. Not one more. So while I was stuck in the house, remember I said we were all doing our work, writing and drawing and singing and quoting poetry to ourselves in the shower. I finished a story last week. It's called Wombat said, come in. And it came from a time uh, not that long ago, but in Australia, there were some wildfires. And I read something in the newspaper. See, we get ideas everywhere, by the way, you guys. Ideas are everywhere you look. Well, I read this thing in the newspaper about wombats. You can look those up, by the way. These wonderful, chubby, stout, furry little Australian creatures have very broad, very big burrows, tunnels under the ground. And when the fire happened, guess what? A lot of animals went and hid in wombat's burrow. That may not be that amazing. I think what's kind of surprising is that wombat let them. <laughs> so in this story, each animal comes along for, he needs to come in and he has a reason. And wombat says, wombat says, come in. Wombat says, come in. Leave, I have to look because it's that new. I don't know it yet. Leave smoke and din and howling wind. Come in, my friend, come in until about the sixth or seventh animal, and he can't wait for them to just go, and the fire is over, and the story ends when the smoke is clear, the ground is cool, and Wombat says, go home, my friends, go home. It's time for me to be alone. It's time for you to go and roam. Go home, get out, go home. And don't we all just feel like that right now? We would love to get out, and we will soon enough, because my father used to say, there is no ill that will last a hundred years, nor a body that could stand. That's what I have to say to you. I'm gonna end with a three minute story, my darlings. <laughs> I, it was wonderful to be, oh, you guys, with Jerry and with Floyd and with Broad. And so this is a three minute story <clears throat> about the world we're in right now, but not at all, huh? Okay. So the thief was brought before the king and the king sentenced him to death. Now, maybe he was a bad king. Or maybe he was a good king who'd had a really rotten day. But in any event, when that thief saw that the gig was up, he flung himself at the king's feet and he pleaded with him, oh, your majesty, if you will give me one year of life, you know that horse I tried to steal, Samson? I will teach him to talk. People started to laugh in the throne room. There was murmuring, tittering, except for the king. The king was watching this thief and he was very silent and he was wondering. Now, the king wasn't a silly man. He knew you couldn't force to talk, children. He wondered. And because it was the king and he could show this kind of largesse, he said, all right, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you one year. One year for you to teach Samson to talk. If in one year that horse cannot talk, you will go to the scaffold. But if Samson opens his mouth and speaks to me, you can climb on his back and ride him out of this kingdom a free man. Guards, and so the guards took the thief off to the stables with him and to the stables they went. And on the way there, don't you just know, one of the guards couldn't stand it. He leaned, and he said, leaned in, you know, and he said, what are you, an idiot? You're never gonna teach that horse to talk. The thief looked up and he said, a year's a really long time, my friend. I could die, 
the king could die. The horse could die. The horse could talk. The world is full of wonders. See ya. And to you guys. Very good. I, I want to say something. Uh -oh. Carmen, began, <laughs> Carmen began her talk with saying that she's not a poet. I mean, you, you just heard one of the most consummate poets of our generation in Carmen Davies. <laughs> it's just amazing. Me, wow. me, my brother. Me, my brother. You know. You know. <laughs> Absolutely. It's wonderful being with you guys. You are just so brilliant, both of you. So, see, we're all patting each other on the back. That's another thing that artists kind of do. We like kind of make ourselves, you know, feel better and go, "Hey, I you <laughs> but we do. We do. You know, we have. We, we you know it helps to have people that love to do to create, and uh, it can be it's, solitary it's, work. Kindred yeah. spirits. It's work to be an artist it's like there's a thing inside of you eat, trying to eat its way out you know yeah uh, it, I always I, I kind of laugh a little bit when people say they, uh, they, they they go to seminars or weekend workshops to increase their creativity and I think that's like going to a workshop to get a fatal disease you know you know the, the, the creativity is like, it, 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 it's like a beast that lives inside of you that, that commands your life to do things that are that you know, I think, good the, funny, I think you know? you're right, Rod. I think you're right. But I think the, the funny thing is, I think people go with every good intention because um, I, 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 I think many adults and even some young people, some young children have had that fire, that imagination, that, um, that sort of sense of there are things in the ether. If they could just grab onto them, they'd know what to do with them. I think they have, have it oftentimes schooled out of them and, and drummed out, out of them and, and, and drummed out of them. And so they go desperate to figure out how do I find it again? And really it's that, what is it? Uh, we said, well, lovely verse, the still we quiet voice. With something they want. Well, it's the still quiet voice though. Yeah. Yeah. But. Huh. So would, yeah. So they, so what you're saying is that these are people who are truly creative, who were born creative, and at some point in their life, it was beaten out of them, or they convinced themselves. I believe that, that most else. people have. It's a Platonian theory, but you know, I do believe that most, nearly everyone, has an area. And see, we th we I think we are very constricting in in our sense of what's creative. Cooking is one of the most creative, beautiful um, um, places to put art. You know, like, and it doesn't have to be a fancy meal. It doesn't have to be a cordon bleu meal. I, I, I had okra and some tomatoes and olive oil and garlic. And next thing I know, I'm making jasmine rice, great balls of fire. And I have friends who have learned to love food because I have this big Cuban family and they'll come over and cook. And they go, I didn't know I could cook. Well, it's there. You know, I think it's nearly, nearly everyone has some place. It may be that your place is something that already has a very clear discipline like visual art, dance. It may be that it's something as, as strange and unusual and wonderful as collecting erasers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, but it has a corollary, you know, it has its, it, what is it, what goes along with it, that, that you actually love to draw and to erase and to create things from, anyway, yeah. that's yeah. my thought. Right. I, I, think, so, I think all kids have it, something. So ch children, I think, now listen okay. just a sec. This, uh, I just remember that Carmen was Cubano. And uh, one of my favorite poets in the world is Jose Martí. Oh, who was okay. Who did. Cultivo okay. una rosa blanca en julio como en enero. Yes. That's what I was going to say. Cultivo una rosa blanca en julio como enero para el amigo. El amigo take sincero it. que me da su mano franca. Y para el cruel que me arranca. Y para el cruel. Que vivo. Finish it. Cardo ni artigo cultivo. Cultivo una rosa blanca. Yeah, I think it speaks to not only uh, uh, something that. that is in everyone. All all humans have this innate sort of thing, and sometimes we lose it. But it's also uh, crosses uh, the continents. It's, it encircles the globe. I mean, crosses cultures. I mean, it's it's like a universal thing, almost like music. You know, well, music yes. is a universal language. Well, art, music is a universal thing. You know, and it's it's pretty astounding when you think about it. You guys have me going really deep here today. And I hope the kids are getting this. But, but I mean, Floyd, I think you're right. And I hmm. think for the children who, and the, the artists 
and the poets and the writers and the storytellers who are listening right now. Yeah. You are living in time. You are living, yes, in strange times, but make notes. Make notes now. Pay attention because the people who live now, those of you now who are living through this, you may create the stories years yeah. from now. You know those history books you open and people write about during World War II, the, you know, the, 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 the French resistance was at uh, World War I, trench warfare. Yeah. That's you now. It's just a right. different flow. Right. But I, I'd love to hear what you guys, before we close, have to say about that. About This is a time to incubate creativity. To just it is. It is. With, with, with what you're saying, Carmen, I was thinking about today and, and put it on my list of Corona poems to write in the series, that, that this is a moment that these children are going to remember and talk about. You Listen, children, you're going to talk about this to your grandchildren 50 yes. years from now, 60 years from now, and you're going to tell them stories about, you know, and this painful, difficult time is going to become one of the most uh, one of the most cherished memories and experiences you've ever had, you know? That's the way life is. And, and, and that's what artists do. They take all of the important things that happen in our lives, some of them fun, some painful, and they package them in a way where we can communicate with each other and share thoughts and feelings. It's a real powerful way to live your life. Uh, yeah. And if you are an artist, if you have that inside of you, never, ever let it go. You may not be able to do it full time as a job, but never stop. You know, the world is full of people who are unhappy and who do terrible things to themselves because you know, with, with addictions and things, because they, they're deep down inside artists and they gave it up. You can't give it up. You got to let the creativity flow. And you got to take experiences like this. What's yeah. that? I didn't mean to interrupt, but uh, no, well, I'm sorry. I said art can save your life. Art's a lifesaver, yeah. Uh, Floyd you're gonna say something but Brad you made me think of something my husband who's a wonderful musician um, one of my favorite things he's ever said to me about creativity um, we were talking once and he said artists take the outside in in other words what we're living right now percolate and then we take the inside out and our job is to interpret for the world yeah. and it isn't always easy and sometimes children it, believe it we love our jobs but it isn't always easy. And sometimes it's excruciating because for us to create art, we have to deal with truth. Yes. Right guys. Yes, and absolutely. Floyd. Yeah. Well, that yeah. truth is an individual thing. Each, each kid out there, you all, you have your own voice, your own way of drawing, your own way of whatever you may watch TV upside down. I mean, that's you. It's special. If you look at the books behind Carmen Didi there, you see all those books. Those are really voices. They're all different voices and your voice can be just as important. And you have to remember that your voice is special and hang on to it because every one, every one of those voices are different, just like yours. And you can join that whole community of books and voices and creating things because yes. you're just as good as everyone else. Just remember that. All right. And remember 30 to 40 drafts. To That's the cranky off. Nana throwing it in there. Every one of us, <laughs> there is, there is inspiration and there's craft and craft means you do it again and again and again and you rip it up and you do it again and you tear it up and you do it again and you hate it and you do it again yeah. and then one day you go yeah oh there you are there you go there yeah. you go hey i can say so, this so there's a i can say this all my years of visiting schools and going to conferences one of the real joys is meeting you people meeting Broad, meeting uh, Floyd, get to know Floyd, get to know Broad, <clears throat> get to know Carmen. And you know, when you first start writing books, you think you're competing with everyone. But then after a while you realize they're totally different and they're totally creative. And they're so interesting Community. and fun mm -hmm. to be with <laughs> and to talk to and to learn from. I can really say that. People ask me about my life and I say, I have had the richest life. You would not believe the people I meet. Meeting like Carmen Didi, meeting Broad Bagger, meeting wow. Floyd Cooper. Yep. I'm, I'm the luckiest guy on earth. And you know what else is interesting? I don't know if you guys thought of this, Broddy. People say to me, are you doing okay being sequestered in your condo in Boston? Are you sure you're okay? They call me, they go, are you being all right? And I thought about it. When you and I... When us, when us four have been out on the road the last 30 years visiting schools, 
we were alone in those hotel rooms for thousands of nights. Yes. <laughs> Aren't we? Yeah. You've already right. done it. You're so exhausted. You don't do anything. You got to go home and go to sleep and get up to the hotel. We've already <laughs> done this. We've already been alone we in hotels for long before. periods of time. And oh, most yeah. of us used it to be creative and write books. And, and many a night I was writing a book lying in bed on my iPhone, on my Blackberry, on my pad, or, you know, or I was thinking of what I story. Yeah. Young I was hoping story. like a month from now, I could say this to the kids would out you, there. Would, would, a month from now, I hope you all look back and say, I did this and this and this and this. I didn't complain. I didn't whine about it. I tried to do something really constructive, creative, fun, or either, you know, either by writing or painting or writing poetry or whatever. That's what I hope. We all look back and say, we use this time constructively. Yeah, one, do you one thing, have any last yeah, words, Bob? You've been trying to say something. Yeah, it, it, Jerry <laughs> just mentioned about uh, meeting his fellow authors. It, 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 What's that? It, there would be almost no way of knowing it. There would be almost no way of knowing this about Jerry if you weren't one of his fellow authors. But he's the most generous person yes. I have ever yes. known. He'll he, 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 he'll go out of his way to to help you as an artist and to and to introduce you to somebody or to help promote your work. And with no expectation of any reciprocity of any kind, it's just what he does, you know? Yeah. It's just yeah. the, 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 this thing we're doing right now, this wonderful conversation, we get to have with just, each other and with you children. And I thought it was it's, just it's, me. It's because of Jerry. <laughs> I thought he just liked me like that. <laughs> Jerry Pilata's generosity, you know, is just a, a wonderful thing. It's true. Well, you guys are very kind to me, and I can't thank you enough for coming on. I Thanks think we should do us. as much. As, I think we should do as much as we can for teachers that are, can't teach their kids because they're not near them. Kids that can't be with their teacher. Oh, what yeah. do they call it? remote learning? I don't know. Hey, I might call you guys back to read one of your books in the next few days. So we'll be here. I hope, I hope you can. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, guys. You. Yeah.